I'm Annie Snyder. I'm a reporter with Greenwire here in D.C. I cover the Defense Department's energy programs, and if you're here right now, I would imagine you know this has been a really active area uh, in recent years. I was going to start by just stepping back for a moment. The U.S. military today has capabilities that even just a few decades ago were really unfathomable. Uh, when you think about the lethality and that forces have, the speed with which they can move across an area, the eyes and ears that they've got on the ground, it's really powerful. But each of those capabilities comes with an increased power demand, and that has opened up some vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities were especially clear uh, in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where Forces were facing an enemy that could not fight it and would not fight them straight on the ground, head to head, uh, and instead were looking for soft spots, and fuel supply lines became a favorite one of those. Uh, literally thousands of troops and contractors moving fuel across the battlefield have been killed or injured. At the same time, in D.C., uh, we were looking at higher fuel prices, not just higher fuel prices, but more volatile fuel prices. And that's caused a lot of problems uh, for folks doing the budgets. It's pretty regularly at this point uh, to get halfway through the year and start hearing service secretaries talking about needing to move money around between budgets, taking money out of other programs to deal with a higher than expected fuel bill. And so those factors have all sort of come together to really create a, a effort to change the way that the military thinks about and uses fuel. Uh, and what's been really interesting about this effort is that it's not just coming from the top here in, here in D.C., it's really coming from commanders on the ground as well uh, who are asking for help dealing with this. Uh, so today we're going to hear from four of the folks, or we're waiting on one of them, so perhaps only three, uh, who've really been walking point on this issue. Uh, I've got directly to my left uh, Colonel Newell. He's the director of the Army's Rapid Equipping Force, uh, where he coordinates, uh, where he goes out and looks for solutions that soldiers are facing today on the battlefield. Looks for, looks to find things that will help them uh, and move them out quickly. To his left, we've got Captain Jim Goudreau. He's the director of the Navy's Energy Coordination Office, where he coordinates the Navy's overall energy strategy, everything from conservation and efficiency to alternative energy, both ashore and afloat. And to his left, we've got Lieutenant Colonel Richard Schilke. He's the Requirements and Technology Branch Head in the Marine Corps' Expeditionary Energy Office. Uh, and if I'm remembering correctly, he came back not too long ago from Afghanistan, uh, where he had served uh, briefly as the liaison for the Expeditionary Energy Office in Helmand Province. So I've asked each of them to give just a, a quick brief on what they're working on and where their energy needs are right now. Uh, and as they get up to give it, I've also asked them to tell us just briefly how they came to be involved in energy issues. I don't think any of them started there, uh, and I find that those stories tend to be a, a really good entree into how the military is thinking about uh, and, and worrying about energy. So, Colonel Newell, if you'll start us off. Oh, we're good. So, um, first, thanks for the, the intro and, and the opportunity to talk. Um, you know, I, I half jokingly say my, my start in energy was uh, my question about uh, why somebody was coming to visit me. And when I got my second or third or fourth visit from an assistant secretary of the Army or an assistant secretary of defense related to energy needs, I realized that somebody was fairly serious about what they wanted to do. Um, I will tell you, as a former brigade commander and somebody at the time who was uh, fighting a significant number of IED, expl improvised explosive device issues in Afghanistan, when folks started talking to me about energy, I, I, I kind of put a hand out said that I hear you, uh, but that's, that's not what the rapid equipping force is, is going to take on right now. Uh, I will also tell you that a, a few months later, uh, I realized just how wrong I was. Uh, so as we started digging into what uh, the reduction of forces in Afghanistan meant to folks, uh, to the guys who were left in Afghanistan, it meant that they were spreading out, that they were in smaller bases, and they were traveling further and further to deliver supplies of fuel and water to those out outer posts. Uh, as an ex brigade commander who had a similar problem in southern Iraq in 2010, I could tell you when you work through the calculus of what that takes uh, to do for the guy who's left behind, 
supplying fuel and water on the battlefield become a huge issue. And they are huge consumers of human capital. Uh, so really, what I'd like to do is, I, I'll go right into the slides, but I'd like to talk to you about the battlefield calculus of what we expend to move something from point A to point B on the battlefield. And folks, folks who talk about price point and what the cost is for a gallon of fuel or, or for water and things like that, I, I tell you, I have a hard time putting a price point on human life. Uh, and I will tell you that in many cases, we are expending human lives to move fuel and water from point A to point B because it's getting harder and harder. Um, so here's, here's the calculus. At the top of the slide, you have two pictures. One is a forward operating base. And at the typical forward operating base, you probably have a battalion-sized organization with somewhere between 600 and 1,000 people. Uh, their sustainment services and their supplies come from what we call log cap. Contracted delivery, probably using local national uh, uh, transportation and labor to get fuel, get water, run the post, and do things. But at that point in the battlefield, it stops. And it becomes a responsibility of the tactical commander, a battalion commander or a brigade commander, to move that further out to his smaller organizations. So what you see on the other side of the slide there is a, a combat operation post, uh, probably sitting on the side of a mountain, probably has 10 to 12 to 14 people on it. There are probably a couple places that fuel and water and those other things have to stop and route to that. But that battalion commander's job is to secure the roads so that he can safely move the supplies from his base out to those outer sites. If you look below that, you see a series of pictures. Those are the, the combat assets that that commander will expend clearing the roads, clearing the routes, securing them, moving a combat logistics patrol of soldiers with that fuel, with that water, uh, to get it from point A to point B. And then once he gets it to a smaller combat outpost, quite honestly, to get to this particular observation post, it was a five-hour walk. No roads, no touchdown point for a helicopter, which meant the soldiers who were moving things had to put it on their back and haul at the top of that hill. And what you see is a nice shot from the springtime. It's not so pretty in the middle of wintertime up there. It's a tough place to work and it's a tough place to get things. So when I talk about the mule fuel, uh, it taking an army, you take just that top bar of pictures, there is an entire staff of probably 20 some odd people who spend their lives synchronizing the assets it takes to enable them to clear a road to get the right helicopters, the right airframes, uh, the right patrols, the right assets, just to make sure that they can move things from one point of the battlefield to the other. There are a number of unmanned aerial system sorties that are flown to provide aerial observation of those routes. There are aviation sorties using helicopters that then follow that to ensure that right in front of the route clearance patrol, those are those engineers with those big heavy vehicles who are designed to find and disable or detonate the IEDs that might be left on that road. Following that is a security patrol whose job it is to get out there and ensure that once those engineers have cleared the road, that it stays clear. Finally, you get the logistics patrol who is, you know, probably 28 vehicles, uh, 50 to 60 soldiers and other folks that it takes to actually move those supplies from one place to the other. We're talking days, not a couple of hours, not a couple of minutes. We're talking days to pull this together when you're trying to move 400 to 800 miles. I had folks like this in southern Iraq in 2010 Literally, this was a day and a half mission. It took them 12 hours to move from my base in central southern Iraq to the next largest base in Amara that was out on the east. They spent the night and they woke up the next morning and it took them another eight hours on a one-lane road to get to our border posts that were on the Iranian border. And then they had to do it all over again coming home. One lane in, one lane out. So even somebody with a, a second grade education could tell that 
They just went by. I now have a couple of days to do whatever I want to set this road up and provide them something to deal with on the way back. Same problem happened when they left the Mara and had to go back to Nasiriyah. Another 12 hours on the road. Total, I have watched brigades in Afghanistan in some of the, the places in the east and the mountains who had to consume up to 1,400 soldiers over a period of two weeks to do some of these resupply missions. That's 1,400 soldiers whose job it was to do something else, to work with the Afghan Navy Force, to work with the Afghan National Police, to provide security who are now dedicated to doing nothing but making sure we can move logistics from one end of the battlefield to the other. You look at the second bar down, that's what happens at those little itty bitty bases out there when it's just 150 soldiers you have to get to that OP up there. There's some soldier or group of soldiers who does the planning. Uh, more unmanned aerial systems. Route clearance in this case, it's not big engineer vehicles. It's a young man with a ground penetrating radar on a stick who has to clear that path from one end to the other. Uh, the security patrol, they're walking. Logistics, we're not talking trucks. We're talking guys with litters and sketcos and things on their back hauling this up the side of the mountains. So energy is a problem to us. Moving it is a problem to us. And then everybody out there is using energy. So we just can compound this, this problem over and over again. Here's uh, just a couple of charts that will show you where we have gone over time. You start uh, in the upper left-hand side there in terms of fuel consumption per soldier. In 1946, down there around five gallons. Today, we're, we're pushing 23, 24 gallons per soldier on the battlefield, 50 percent of which is being used to provide electricity. And I'll tell you, you get out to that combat outpost, that one that's way up on the mountain, about 90 percent is used to provide electricity for those guys to run their radios, uh, to run a heater uh, that's putting heat into something that has nothing but open windows around it. Below that, the cost to the soldiers walking around on the ground. You look at the lower left-hand side there, you can see the dismounted soldiers load. Where we started back in World War II, somewhere around 80 pounds, which, by the way, is 10 pounds more than we know somebody should carry going into combat. Afghanistan today is somewhere between 120 and 158 pounds. 120 to 158 pounds on the back of the soldiers out there walking up and down those mountains every single day. If they leave a FOB or a combat outpost for three days, everything they need for that three days goes on the back. You see at the bottom right hand side of that slide in terms of where that weight goes, lethality, ammunition. Survivability, body armor. Sustainment, water, food. C2 is a radio. Mission equipment, another 6 to 18 pounds, and then batteries. In some cases, 18 pounds worth of batteries on the back of those guys just to run the equipment that they're working with. To compound the problem, we, organizations like mine, who are charged with providing solutions to problems as they pop up on the battlefield, uh, have provided them additional equipment, whether it's robots or whether it's something to combat uh, an IED or something else. We have gone from the beginning of war 2002, where soldiers were averaging about 120 watts per day, to today where the average soldier is running at about 184 watts of power. That's without adding this extra equipment. Another 250 pounds on their backs, distributed across nine guys, who are consuming something like 4,000 watt hours to operate all this equipment on the battlefield. Those are the problems. That's the, the battlefield calculus uh, and the cost to us in human capacity that it takes us to do this. That's why the Rapid Equipment Force got invested in operational energy and moving energy on the battlefield. So with that, I will gladly pass off to my, my comrades here. Captain Goudreau. Thanks, Annie. And also, uh, just want to say thanks to RP and Cheryl Martin and her team for putting on uh, a, a tremendous symposium and conference to take a look at some radical 
design technology that may have disruptive value and in innovation. Um, that's essentially what we need. You know, Annie asked when we uh, how each one of us got into energy. All my life, I've been a logistician for the Navy. So as a supply corps officer, I'm responsible for getting something from point A to point B whenever somebody needs it. That's been enough of an experience to know that this is a really challenging business. This is a big commodity. We use a lot of it. It didn't really strike home about why we needed to change our approach to energy until I was in my last job uh, running all the logistics for the amphibious forces in the Seventh Fleet. For those of you who don't know, the Seventh Fleet is in the Asian Pacific Theater, and it stretches from Hawaii to the border between India and Pakistan. It is a huge expanse of ocean. It is a very busy expanse of ocean with a tremendous amount of disasters. And almost two years ago now, I was sitting in my office on a Friday afternoon, and we started to watch the news and realized that there had been an earthquake off of Sendai that triggered a tsunami that swept ashore in Japan. And as the amphibious force, we knew we would be responding. We immediately turned our ships all in one direction, steaming as fast as they could, started flying aircraft to where they needed to be pre-staged, started consuming tremendous amounts of fuel. It was complicated, and it looked like a really, really big disaster, and we got there as quickly as we could. We spent a lot of energy getting there, which meant it was incredibly complicated just to do the fuels and resupply to get there. But it got even worse. As we approached, we realized that the reactor at Fukushima was melting down, and there was a radioactive plume. And it went from an incredibly tragic situation to an even more incredibly demanding technical situation. And as we consumed that energy during those daily operations, we had to get resupplied. But we ran into a problem. Because of the radioactive plume, our supply ships could not approach closer than 200 nautical miles from shore. And so during some of the most critical times of that mission, when we were hoping that we were recovering and helping survivors, as opposed to clearing debris and recovering the remains of 25,000 souls, we steamed over the horizon to get fuel. We left our partners from the government of Japan, who we were working alongside with to, to work through this, and we went to get fuel because we couldn't get it any closer than 200 miles. The last thing anybody involved in that wanted to see was any of the relief effort steaming over the horizon because we had run out of gas. We consume it so quickly for basic missions that we require that resupply. We showed up in some cases with low tanks because we used so much energy. And then we had to go a day to two days out of the relief area to get the fuel before we could come back in. And that's when it really struck home that how we approach energy and how we consume energy as a fleet has to fundamentally change not just in combat, but during sustained maritime global operations, because we do the mission that we have to do every single day all around the globe. And so, consequently, if you take a look at what we use and where we use it, just to get a scope of it, our consumption behavior is, is forecasted to do nothing but increase. It has done nothing but increase. We currently use 1.3 billion gallons of fuel every year to perform our operations. We spend $4 billion a year to pay for that fuel to conduct our operations. We use most of it on destroyers and cruisers, and we use most of it on the aviation side with our tactical air, our Hornets, which, of course, are the workhorses for the fleet, the most common ships and the most common aircraft. And we've treated energy for the last 60 years as something that's like air. As a logistician, I can tell you, whenever somebody needed it, we got it there, no matter how much they needed, no matter when, and no matter where. But as a result, the operators across the fleet have assumed that it would always be there. The folks that have determined what our new capabilities would be have always assumed that it would be there. And there was no reason to think differently. So over the course of 60 years, of treating like this, every time we replace one system, we replaced it with another system that delivered greater capability, but also consumed greater and greater amounts of energy. And if you want to compare, the LCS, which is going to replace the frigate and the fleet, consumes as much as 70% more energy per day than a frigate did. The P8, replacing a P3, 25% increase in energy consumed per flight hour. 
the Joint Strike Fighter, as it replaces the Hornet as our premier fighter attack aircraft, a 60% increase in energy consumed per flight hour. And the Joint Strike Fighter, as it replaces the Harrier, a 110% increase in the energy consumed per flight hour. So our ability to support that in sustained operations becomes more and more challenging. It becomes more and more daunting and exposes us to greater and greater vulnerability. The challenge of the future, though, becomes even more complex. When you talk to someone that says, hey, the ship of the future is going to have this. It's going to have an advanced missile defense radar. It's going to have directed energy weapons. It's going to have railgun. The amount of energy that we need exponentially increases beyond what we consume today. So if we think that it's challenging today, if we think we use a lot today, if we think that we're open to vulnerabilities either from volatility in the market and the price of the fuel impacting our sustained readiness, or just getting that fuel to the warfighter, we're increasing the amount of vulnerability we're exposed to. So as we tackle that, we need radical design change. We need material solutions. We need things that will scale correctly, that will fit into the ships that we have. We need a different approach to technology great example, radar. Radars produce heat. A lot of the energy we use to run a radar is lost in thermal load that we then have to manage. We consume even more energy managing that thermal load in an HVAC system. How about we use radical redesign and material solutions to reduce that thermal load to begin with, reduce the amount of energy required to do that basic mission. But it's got to be practical. It's got to be survivable. It's got to fit into the fleet that we have today and the fleet that we may have tomorrow. You know, my boss is fond of saying is that history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. And if you take a look at what has happened in the past, we have recognized the vulnerability associated with energy in the battlefield previously. World War II and the Atlantic and the Pacific are great examples of that. Our enemies of today have recognized that and taken advantage of it. We need innovation and we need a different approach to war fighting and a different approach to technology. Whether it was the innovation during World War II that led to Doolittle's raid with army bombers on a Navy carrier, who then launched 200 miles earlier when they were discovered by a Japanese fishing fleet and still managed to make that mission successful, or something more radical like what got us to the moon, we need to think differently. In World War II, Admiral King put out a poster that said, oil is ammunition, stick to your job. Well, looking into the future, oil literally will be ammunition when we start to deploy ships with energy-based weapon systems, the amount of oil that we have in our gas tanks will equate to the amount of rounds in a magazine today. We need the solutions to be practical, scalable, survivable, and, uh, and most of all, they can be worked on by sailors and marines out in the field. We can't have a spruce goose as a solution, because as innovative as that was, it wasn't a practical solution. Bottom line is, we're most vulnerable when we replenish whether it's in port or whether it's underway. For those of you that haven't served in the Navy, a replenishment at sea means that two ships steam on the same course for four hours, 120 feet apart. It's about as vulnerable as you would ever get. And we need to get away from that. We need to solve our vulnerabilities and we need to move forward and redesign how we consume energy. Thank you. Colonel Silkey. Uh, first, I'd like to echo uh, Captain Gaudreau's thanks, Annie, for uh, moderating, and thanks to uh, RPE. Really excellent uh, summit. I think uh, what happens here, uh, what I see in this audience, is, is a lot of uh, cross-disciplinary opportunity. And, uh, and as we've learned in the past three years, uh, there, are, there are huge opportunities uh, when we work together as a team. And uh, I think that's what this conference is about, and, and it really points out some uh, the potential for the future. I think that's where, uh, where our opportunities lie. Lieutenant uh, Colonel Rick Schilke, I'm with the Expeditionary Energy Office and Headquarters Marine Corps. Uh, we are charged with analyzing, developing, and directing an expeditionary energy strategy for the Marine Corps so that we can optimize energy across all of our warfighting capabilities. The office was established uh, back in late 2009, and I've been with the office for about two and a half years. So to the question of, uh, of how I came to be involved with energy issues, uh, uh, I could say tongue-in-cheek out of a deep sense of remorse for about 2,000 hours in fighter aircraft. 
but I'd be lying. Uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> uh, really, uh, thinking about it, uh, about 12, 13 years ago, uh, I was in graduate school and uh, first got introduced to, uh, to kind of the, the bleak future, the gathering storm, if you will, uh, of our kind of energy challenges, uh, both technical challenges and strategic challenges. I uh, kind of filed that away uh, and went back out to the operating forces and uh, uh, did my time in the fleet and uh, you know continued to kind of kind of watch those uh, energy related issues you know everybody kind of forgot about it life was good and we were well past the crisis of the of the 1970s and uh, and so it really wasn't at the fore you know when when I was hearing about it from some very smart people in uh, school uh, you know it was kind of before energy was cool and uh, but again I didn't forget that in my previous job uh, to this, then, as I came back from the operating forces, I was uh, involved in rapid capabilities development, doing work very similar to what Colonel Newell's organization does. In that time, I saw the, the, the incredible uh, expansion of our capabilities that Annie referred to, uh, the lethality we were developing, the ability to generate autonomy at levels we've never, never seen before. And all of that was coming uh, through equipment and technology uh, that allowed us to distribute on the battlefield. And uh, it started to, to occur to me, it was almost intuitive, uh, that that was coming at a price. Uh, not just in terms of quantity of equipment uh, and the weight issues that you heard about already, but in, in terms of the, the, uh, the power demand uh, of all of that equipment out on the battlefield and the distribution problem that's been well articulated already today. So I think that, uh, that then coupled with the opportunity uh, to come to this office is probably what, uh, what got me uh, uh, here. So wrong place, wrong time, or right place, right time, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but I've enjoyed it. Uh, it's been, been incredibly interesting work. And, uh, and again, meeting folks like yourselves uh, has been a big part of that, and I've really enjoyed it. So the Marine Corps, as I said, we've established a, a strategy. And, and the key in that strategy is the mission statement that says, by 2025, we are going to deploy and sustain our forces ashore uh, using only f liquid fuel for mobility applications, and that those mobility applications are going to be more fuel efficient than our systems are today. That really began with a look at future security environments and Marine Corps operating concepts that in some regards look very similar to what we've been doing the past 12 years, distributing the force, trying to, uh, to lighten our footprint ashore, uh, be very agile, uh, and, and, and be able to be as autonomous as possible. Those, then, those concepts have been formed an expeditionary energy strategy signed by our Commandant in February 2011. Again, all this thinking and all these documents were, were critical then to assessing our gaps uh, in the expeditionary energy, water, and waste uh, capabilities-based assessment, which resulted in an ICD, an initial capabilities document that's now approved as a joint uh, document, and outlines 152 gaps, 52 of which are material gaps. So note that it's not all material, but there's a lot in there, and, 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 I'll, and I'll probably come back to this later. You know, the ethos aspect of this, <laughs> the behavioral aspects, the non-material aspects of our, of our challenges are, are tremendous, and they go hand-in-hand -hand with the material challenges. That ICD is now informing, uh, those gaps are now informing our s and objectives in the Marine Corps Science and Technology Strategic Plan, and they're informing the Experimental Forward Operating Base, which was an effort established back in 2010 to try to accelerate the learning curve for us, for us uh, look for immediate opportunities to impact the current theater, uh, at the time really uh, OEF, uh, Afghanistan, uh, but informing the requirements uh, development process, informing our investment decisions, and now we have, we've evolved this into an enduring process uh, to continue to expedite the infusion of the energy ethos and, and new material uh, into our processes. Uh, you see there at the bottom of my chart, uh, there's a policy aspect to this too. We've attempted to not generate a new, necessarily new processes, but rather to, uh, to kind of codify uh, what it is we see as the way forward. Uh, we've, we've solve some of the easier problems perhaps, or not solve, but we, we've, we've mitigated some of the easier problems in our current theater, but we know we got a lot of long fights uh, still out there. The way we believe we're going to do that is by forcing energy performance to be considered throughout our requirements and acquisition processes. Uh, so how do we do that? How do we think about energy metrics and measures and attributes and then force uh, everyone along the way to consider it and, and not lose it in the trade space? 
Uh, that's, that, that is a critical to our, to our strategy now. We are, we are taking our gaps and, and we are attempting to look at you know, what is the state of the art. We've spent three years kind of studying this, this problem and, and learning a, a, an awful lot. And now we're assessing, well, what is it going to take us to get to that 2025 mission statement? How far are we really uh, from meeting that mission statement? So I'm going to show you on the next slide one example of our technology roadmap and how we're thinking about this in the context of the metrics and measures in our ICD what we know about the state of the art and where the programs are currently headed and, and where we know we still have gaps to be addressed. And this is just one example of the challenges we face. So if you take our ground power, one thing we've learned is that we have a lot of generators. We started uh, prior to the war with about 3,800-ish generators in the Marine Corps. We have over 14,000 in our inventory today. So that ground power generation is a significant aspect of distributing the force and, and it's been a source of not only uh, fuel consumption but maintenance challenges for us as well. As we transition into our next generation uh, generators, you see that we can extend our time without resupply. Uh, in this case, uh, my example is a company uh, with command and control capabilities uh, that we're, uh, we're using as a, as a stocking horse here. We know that by about 2015, 2017, the Marine Corps now engaged with the Army is going to be fielding hybrid power systems on the ground. You see that starts to extend our time uh, on the ground, or our operating time on the ground unresupplied. We get out to 2020, uh, we don't know where the answers there are, but we know that one of them is we've got to solve this challenge of climate control on the battlefield. If uh, Obviously uh, static operations that we've been in, uh, or the more static operations are a little different from, from uh, a maneuver uh, scenario. However, we're always going to need it, at least for our command and control. How do we do that more efficiently? Because it is the driver of our ground power requirements. And finally, you see that to get to our 120 days, 120-day uh, day goal, uh, we've still got a ways to go, and that's not an easy mile to cross there. So how do we bring down the demand of all of our capabilities when, when the push, as you've heard, is always going to be for more capability? Our focus is on mission effectiveness, but we want, we want to broaden the thinking, like I said, to consider energy in the trade space and look for those opportunities for uh, both demand side reduction and more efficient uh, power production as a way to bridge that gap. So this is where we really need the innovation. And that starts by getting it into our requirements so that it starts to guide our program managers and that in turn guides industry uh, designs uh, to help get us across that, uh, that valley of death there. So with that, my time is up, Annie. I will uh, pass the mic. Thank you. We have had Dr. Mark Mayberry uh, join us. Uh, he is the Chief Scientist of the Air Force, serving as the lead scientific advisor to the Chief of Staff and the Secretary of the Air Force, and works across the service with the Air Staff, Operational Commanders, Combatant Commanders, Acquisition Community, and of course the Science and Technology Community. Uh, Dr. Mayberry, I was asking everybody to start out with a, just a quick kind of introduction to how you came to be working on energy. First of all, I apologize for coming late. Of course, I was stuck in the building. We have nothing to do over in the Pentagon these days, so you know, I just love to get out here. Um, uh, the uh, I got I got involved um, by a comedy of errors or by by mistake. Um, I showed up at the Pentagon as a three-star equivalent uh, two and a half years ago, and the secretary said, "I need an energy strategy." And I said, but sir, I've, I have 30 years of computer science background. I know how to build robots and autonomous vehicles. And, and uh, <clears throat> I think you really want to use me as a cyber guy. And he said, no, I need an energy S&T strategy. So that's how I got involved. Um, uh, so uh, fortunately, uh, and I want to um, thank Andy for this panel um, and uh, also thank ARPA E uh, because we immediately, I immediately, uh, we, we were fortunate to actually have an undersecretary of, of, uh, of energy, uh, Dr. Geis, Kevin Geis, um, and also uh, Secretary Yonkers, two, two individuals who know quite a little, uh, quite a lot about energy. But we intentionally re reached out uh, via something I'm going to show you in just a minute to uh, not only ARPA E, the DOE, but also to the other services, to NSF, to DARPA, uh, to frankly the national laboratories, which have a significant significant investment. In fact, my total portfolio in S&T is about, uh, the, of, of our money, is two and a half billion dollars. Fortunately, we are, we are uh, granted money or given money by places like Missile Defense Agency, which care about things like directed energy that we do pretty well. 
We have other agencies like DARPA and the like who care about, and NASA who care about efficient, uh, uh, efficient uh, um, aircraft and the like. So we have a lot of lot of collaborations across the government. So for every dollar we spend in science, we actually get another dollar. So my budget's actually five billion dollars. That sounds pretty good, until you meet the Department of Energy, who spends five billion dollars in research on energy. So my energy budget is actually about $350 million, which is a piddlance compared to what DOE invests. And by the way, as much as $5 billion sounds like a lot of money, <clears throat> the real money is being spent in the private sector. $1.4 trillion spent in S&T globally, $4 to $500 billion spent in this country alone. So if we're looking at places to leverage, we ought to look outside the government in addition to the government. So with, with having, having said that, that's how I got involved, Annie. Um, I actually think the panel's m mislabeled because I'm an Air Force guy. Um, it's about uh, supposedly the, uh, the um, op uh, energy as a tactical advantage, but in fact energy is a strategic advantage. Um, uh, and, and I'll try to illustrate that with uh, some particular points. If we go to the next slide, or maybe I, do I control it? Maybe I control it. There we go. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, um, because we have a short period of time and I'm more interested in the conversation, because I know what's in here, um, Google Energy Horizons, you will read our great insight, if you will, wisdom that we collected, <clears throat> not just from the Air Force, but from across the government and importantly from the private sector. Uh, we, we got uh, many inputs, both classified and unclassified. <clears throat> this report is entirely unclassified. Uh, but as you can see, Energy Horizons articulates, and I won't talk about our energy strategy that's also online. You can read about that. It's very consistent with the energy operational industry strategies at OSD and also in the other services. Our focus, of course, is on aviation, on space, and on um, cyber. Uh, energy efficiency. And we have a set of uh, near, mid, mid and long term goals and importantly, and this actually is something we got from a foreign, former undersecretary uh, of the Department of Energy, we actually explicitly identify where we in the Air Force will lead, where we're going to follow and where we're going to watch. Uh, we identify where we're going to prioritize. So cer certain energy, operational energy things the Navy is doing and the Army is doing that we in, are, are by, de by design not investing in. Um, there are other areas where the other services are not investing where we are. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of those. So in the air, we're looking at efficient engines. We have a joint program with the Navy. Right now, ground testing two engines that will be more efficient by 25% than any jet engine on the planet today. That's the Advent system. Uh, or systems. Uh, they're two prime performers, General Electric in, in uh, Wolfsworth, North America. Those engines, uh, will, like I said, will complete ground testing this year. We also care about structures. We have designs for structures that are 70 to 80 percent more efficient than any aircraft that exists on the planet today. Those are designs been validated by NASA as independent review. We actually have aircraft we've flown, uh, flying wings, which take 15 percent off the weight because we don't have tails on them. We put, uh, we, we put winglets on them. That gives us maybe only about a half a percent in, in actual uh, real operational tests um, uh, and other mechanisms to make those uh, aviation uh, machines more efficient uh, by the, or by the order orders of about 25 to 30 uh, percent. Now, now, when you talk about what this means, um, I wish I had the Navy's problem. The Navy's got a $4 billion bill. My bill is twice as big as theirs. My bill is $9 billion every year in fuel. Last year alone, the variance, Congre uh, DOD came back to us and said, Fuel was a little bit more expensive this year. Our variance was a billion dollars. We pay that bill, and we pay it from other accounts. So that means we have to go and five, find a billion dollars out of a $110 billion budget to pay for our fuel bill. Very painful. Um, so we're really quite serious about this. I'll give you an example, though, where you don't necessarily need invention, but you just need innovation. Uh, we just completed a joint, uh, last month, completed a joint um, flight formation. We took our C-17s, which you may, may know, consume, if I, if I showed you an actual fuel consumption rate, they'd be about maybe 20% or so of our bill. And like the Navy and, 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 and the Army, our bills are going up, right? Our F-35, our Joint Strike Fighter, twice as consumptive as our previous uh, fighters. Now, it's a great fighter, does a lot of, lot of amazing things, but it's extremely expensive to keep in the air. Uh, it turns out that actually we can fly our aircraft in formation. Birds don't fly in flocks because they do it for our pleasure. They do it like me, being a mathematician, because they're lazy. Uh, birds actually save energy by flying in formation. And I can tell you exactly how much energy, because we just completed, uh, our C-17s will save. We had a joint program with DARPA, Boeing, and Air Mobility Command. Dr. Uh, Don Erbschel ran that, our chief scientist of Air Mobility. And we saved between uh, eight, se seven and a half to 13%, call it 10% on average, flight by actually just flying 
two to three thousand, four, five thousand feet off the, 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 the wing of a C-17. Didn't require any innovation, didn't require any, any, uh, any new investment. It was just changing the way we behave. Uh, significant savings, we're now looking at how we roll that out. We only got a minute, so there's lots of other examples I could give you of things we're doing that are going to give a strategic advantage to us. What's strategic? Staying in the air twice as long. Uh, are we have new photovoltaics. We right now, the United States and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Germany hold the efficiency record, 42.5%. Some people th say, think the physical limitation is actually 70%, uh, but in fact, we're doing things in nano that will revolutionize uh, how energy will be uh, more efficient. We have the world's uh, most efficient high-performance computer in the world, 50,000 nodes. It's a, it's a machine called the Condor. It runs up upstate New York. It runs on PlayStation 3s. We bought the whole line one, one, one year from, from IBM. Uh, and just like your d devices that sit in your, in your pocket, um, those PlayStation shut down when not used. Uh, so today, amazingly, th this has been true for the past two years. We have the whole most, most efficient supercomputer in the world. I can't believe no one has, has tried, tried to beat, beat us. Uh, we have other, other, lots of examples we can talk about, directed energy investments. I can talk to you about the computer they have that's sitting in my pocket that we're helping to invest in that literally is, uh, looks like a Band-Aid. Uh, this computer can uh, sense up to 6,000 uh, 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 Gs of force. I can put it in my helmet. It looks like a Band-Aid. It actually can, can conform to my face. Uh, it can measure my soldiers' pressure, temperature, and so on. It requires almost no energy to run. In fact, we could actually run it probably off your body energy if we wanted. So we're doing things actually which hopefully will provide strategic advantage to our forces in the future. Happy to answer any questions, but if you're interested, please read, global, uh, re read Energy Horizons if you have any particular interests. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So as we move to the conversation now, please start sending in your questions. There's instructions up here. Uh, but I will start out. Uh, you've all been going at this really hard for the last few years. What are the lessons that you've learned in that time about what works, where the big savings are, and maybe what doesn't work? Uh, and I'll start out with you, Colonel Zilke. Okay. Thanks. A great question. As I said in my remarks, we've learned a ton. Uh, but picking a few that I think may be of interest to this, this crowd, I'll, I will say uh, one is that solar uh, does have a place in our capabilities. Uh, we're figuring out all of the different niches still and where that fits. But one thing we've definitely learned is we've got to make it lighter, we've got to make it smaller, and we've got to make it more efficient. No surprises. Uh, but we have efforts underway uh, to work all of those aspects of the problem, and, and frankly, it's on the horizon. Uh, the challenge will be cost, uh, as, as you all can suspect. Uh, we need the ability to optimize our charging capabilities in a scalable fashion from wearable power systems on Marines to our larger, more stationary uh, capabilities that might uh, eventually sit on a, a future FOB. Um, we also need other alternative for uh, renewable sources. We've got to find some other alternatives that work in all environments and in all conditions. Uh, so if you've got any great ideas, please don't hold back. Uh, second one, and I brought it up earlier as well, and that is hybrid uh, power. We, we believe there's great opportunity in, in applying hybrid power to reduce our fuel consumption, but also to enable some of these concepts we want to apply in the future where we're going to distribute the force, much like we've looked in Afghanistan, although maybe not quite as big a footprint. Uh, but putting forces out there beyond the reach of their enablers at times, uh, we want to be able to reduce not only their fuel consumption and resupply requirements, but their maintenance requirements, et cetera, and we think hybrid is one of those enablers. Uh, we've completed an analysis of alternatives on hybrid power, uh, and, and the Army, uh, along with us, is uh, we are sitting down together and we are writing a joint capabilities development document uh, on a family of systems. It's going to range from small and around a three kilowatt capability up to hundreds of kilowatts of capabilities. And that was based on the learning of, of the Army's efforts and our efforts uh, through the XFOB and through this analysis of alternatives. Uh, it's moving forward, and, and I think it's going to be a great thing. Um, if you haven't uh, already seen it, uh, we gave an industry day brief about a month ago um, outlining our learning and, and kind of giving some guidance to industry as a kickoff for the next XFOB, which will take place in May. Um, the request for information for that XFOB closes out this Friday, but if you haven't seen it, that video is posted on our website. Uh, my slides uh, had the link, and, and I'll be happy to share it with you afterwards. I have some cards with the, uh, with the link on it. The last thing I'll say is, is and I think I, I hammered this uh, earlier as well, is we've got to find ways to reduce the demand 
of all of our capabilities. We realize we're not going to get there just through more efficient production. Uh, and that is perhaps the biggest challenge. Uh, and, and the way we're going to get there is by valuing that in our decisions and, and empowering Marines uh, to think about it in all that they do. I can uh, just add, add an example, um, actually from General McNabb, uh, the commander just retired of U.S. United States Transportation Command. He probably spends more fuel than anybody on the planet, um, except U.S. drivers. Uh, so, uh, by joke about that, we'll, we'll, we can talk, get, come back to that, because uh, we actually are a de minimis portion of this problem, but we have a serious mission. Um, General McNabb uh, was very clever in the way that he was able to get MRAPs into theater. Um, we used to fly him in the air. You know, load them, load them up in C-5s. Put, put, uh, we put a course, a course helicopters into C-17s and so on. Uh, and there's a time when you need to get to the battlefront quickly. It's important. But when you're going to be there for a while, you don't necessarily have to send it via FedEx. Uh, we have measures of operational uh, costs of energy that range per gallon as much as $400 per gallon, or maybe more. If you have to fly uh, fuel in to a location, that's extremely expensive. And we do have to do that sometimes. What uh, General McNabb did is he took, he, he, he had, he had an analysis of what he called multimodal transportation. Basically, you can send it by land, you can send it by sea, you can send it by air. So what he did is he kept flying MRAPs in because we needed them. But he started putting them on ships. And he made a big pipeline from the U.S. all the way over to theater. And that pipeline took a while. But once that pipeline got filled in, in we stopped flying. That to me is innovation. It's not invention. I, I love invention. I, I'm a scientist. Uh, but I think invention has its place. I think we have to be more innovative. If we fly our aircraft the way the birds fly aircraft, we save 10% save of our emissions. Now, not every mission is going to be able to be flown like that. But we estimate somewhere between 25, maybe some people say upwards of 40% of our C-17 missions might be able to be flown that way. But even if we could fly 10% of them, that's a huge amount of money savings. So my, my suggestion would be let's be more creative. Hey, uh, going back to what did we learn, I, I will tell you the first lesson we learned was, was that we had to change the narrative. Uh, you know, when I talk about uh, particularly renewable energy, um, when you put a, a young man or woman in harm's way, and I mean truly in harm's way out at the edge of the battlefield, we will do what is absolutely necessary to get them the power and energy they require to do the job. But when you're willing to go to such lengths to deliver that solution to somebody, it changes the dynamic of cost. I talk about the cost in human capital, not the cost in dollars and cents. That cause us to take a second look at where it was, where it made sense for renewable energies to go on the battlefield. And what we found was uh, it made a whole lot of sense out at the tactical edge where we were going through great expense to move fuel from point A to point B. Uh, we also realized that there had to be significant uh, change in the culture and in the education of our young men and women who are out there uh, roaming the battlefield. And we're not talking about the scientists. We are talking about uh, folks with high school education who are already 120 percent cognitively overtasked with the things they have to do just to survive and perform a mission. So we had to find ways to deliver to them the education they needed to become better power managers uh, while delivering it in a manner that quite honestly was part of their life. We also identified five factors that made a lot of sense in the solutions we deliver to people. We talk about size, bulk, weight, uh, form fit, whether or not the solution we're delivering fits with the other equipment they're using, uh, complexity, uh, which essentially means if, if I give something to a young man or woman out there, then it takes 20 steps to use versus the three that they were doing before. It's going to sit in a pile in the corner of a five someplace and never see the light of day. And durability. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, quite honestly, just how fast somebody can break something that we thought was unbreakable. Those five factors uh, all now feed into uh, how we look at solutions. Size, weight, form fit, complexity, and durability. 
and we judge things based on all five of those being workable. Anyone, any one of the five that doesn't work is enough to cause a soldier to discard a perfectly good solution to a problem if you miss one of those. Um, we clearly recognize that the greatest challenge out there is getting the weight off our soldiers back. And even though my organization tells herself is lightening the soldier's load, I, I will tell you it's a misnomer. That just means I give lighter weight equipment to a guy and I keep piling stuff on his back. The only way I'm ever possibly going to lighten the load is to change the dynamics of the battery and the power of this running and stuff. I have a chemistry problem. I need more high capacity batteries that are stable. I need fewer different types of battery to run the equipment that a soldier is carrying on his back. I need the ability to transfer power from point A to point B wirelessly. And I could continue those I needs probably for another 20 minutes, but that's, that's really, uh, really at the top of the pile of what those young men and women are telling us about the solutions that we've delivered so far. I think some of our challenges are really just becoming more aware and behaving in different fact and fa uh, fashions. Yeah, you know, just like the Marine Corps is approaching culture change from a, a, a very systemic point of view, uh, the Marine Corps and the Army have benefited from lessons learned in combat over the last 10 years, lessons learned the hard way. And trying to get uh, folks who have not been in sustained combat to say that, hey, we have comparable vulnerabilities and to fundamentally change how we operate. And instead of thinking that you save energy when you're training and you just spend as much energy as you need as when you're in combat, uh, is a big change to how the Navy has approached energy and, and is going to approach it. But the more we consume at sea in operations, the more untenable the support posture becomes and the more risk we assume. So just trying to get to the point that, that people recognize that and get to it is uh, a big issue for us and maybe one of the biggest challenges. You can make the equipment as efficient as you want by putting technology in or buying something that's more efficient and more capable. But if you give someone a Prius and they drive it like a Ferrari, it's still going to waste a lot of energy. And so how do we get to the point that, that it's used the right way? Well, so this question might dovetail on that. It's a question from the audience, uh, which is, what have you gotten wrong? What, what have you maybe thought was going to work and just didn't at all? Um, from a culture perspective, I mean, for us, I mean, there are two sides of that. What have we gotten wrong in execution from a technical perspective and a culture perspective? I think sometimes uh, in early days, people connected it with, hey, we're doing this to be in green or we're doing this to save money because there were different statements or there are different articles that are attributed to that. And really, at the end of the day, it's about giving us capability through efficiency and through changing the operations. And so when you start down that path and people start to think, hey, this is about being green or it's, a, it's about some different agenda, it's very tough to, to recorrect and to actually extend that education. And uh, in, from the technology perspective, I think we took some commercial off-the-shelf technology and put it onto our ships when it came to hull coating, propeller coating, some other things which have great commercial success. But the reason they have commercial success is if you cover the hull on a Maersk liner that's moving at 14 knots constantly every single hour of every single day, that's incredibly effective and gives you great gains. If you put it on a ship that is only underway 100 days out of 300, and is sitting at the pier the rest of the time, and even when it's underway, maybe at bare steerage way for nighttime ops as they do circles at three knots, it doesn't have the same effect and doesn't have the same efficiency. And so we're, we're learning to be more, uh, more mindful of how we're using the equipment and how the commercial technology is used in previous applications. Any other bloopers? No, I <laughs> it, it, here's what I say. I, I am I'm blessed to work in an organization where my bosses say, if I'm learning something, I didn't necessarily get anything wrong. Um, I will tell you, we've learned a lot of lessons. <laughs> um, we, we tried um, fuel cells for dismounted soldiers to recharge batteries, methane, propane, some other things. And um, while it is a novel approach, it failed the form fit uh, and it failed the complexity problem. So we learned a lot about fuel cells. We kind of learned where things were appropriate. But we also learned that uh, our, our soldiers are very quick 
to look at it sideways and say that that's great, but where does the rest of my gear go? So we, we also, from that, learn to engage uh, those young men and women much earlier in the process to get them involved in providing solutions. And quite honestly, in a lot of cases, I, I think the solutions are resident in their heads. We just have to figure out how to draw it out. G give you a couple examples um, from the air domain and space domain. Um, uh, one is, uh, as you know, we successfully uh, are able to shoot down with lasers missiles, uh, which I think is kind of extraordinary, uh, you know, something you'd re read in a magazine when I was a kid. Um, now, unfortunately, we need a 747 full of a bunch of chemicals to do it, uh, so in our airborne laser. So, you know, it's not so humanly nice to have. Um, so I don't know that that was unexpected, but the point is oftentimes when we build systems, we don't, we don't understand the second, third order effects of those systems. We now actually have miniaturized our chemical-based um, lasers, uh, and of course in addition to having solid state lasers, about, a, about a 150, 125 kilowatt level today, um, we're moving towards gigawatt level uh, uh, airborne lasers. This is, this is what we want. Um, but uh, the second uh, example of this is uh, photovoltaics, right? Everybody thinks, oh, we're going to go green. Sounds great. Well, what do you do with all that PV after you're done with it, right? Oh, and by the way, you've got to clean that PV because it gets dust in it. And so the actual operational efficiency doesn't turn out to be as great. It's like when we give our soldiers and our, our airmen, our P PJs, um, we give them, uh, you know, less, uh, more power for less weight. And what do they do? They carry more ammunition and more water. Right, uh, so we don't actually affect them exoskeletally. We actually, uh, you know, just encourage them because we haven't actually affected their behavior. A couple other examples: in, in the desert, we uh, we clean our engines. Uh, we get about one percent efficiency by engine washing. Uh, similarly, by putting uh, air, uh, basically um, winglets on the in the edge of our aircraft, we can we can increase efficiently uh, increase efficiency by about one percent in theory. Well, you go to the desert, and what we actually discovered, what the British had forgot, a lesson they forgot and we, we discovered, was actually that sand, fine-grained sand, when it's mixed with engine wash, which is just actually purified water, actually creates a nice uh, glassy shear on the top of our, uh, on our engines, which is not very good. Um, so the problem is, similarly, the winglets actually turn out to actually only have about a half a percent efficiency, according to our industrial uh, assessments across our fleet. And so actually the additional weight and the additional maintenance that they imply washes away the benefit. So I think we have to be really careful that what looks good uh, in design, when it's actually put in use with real, real military folks in real operational environments, and or the life cycle implications of it, don't always yield what we expect. So, so as you're tackling your challenges, how are you reaching out to the non-defense community, either through contractors or small businesses? I know there have been some innovative approaches through each of the services. Can you just give us a quick hit of how you're doing that? Rather take time. We, uh, we've hit upon a means of running what I would call a series of workshops. We get away from working groups and conferences uh, where we bring together folks from the operations side of the field actually talk about the problems very openly for about a day uh, and then we'll hang around for another day and talk to the small business and vendors and render an opinion on whether their product or their thoughts or their ideas are relevant. So we get into those discussions about size, weight, form, fit, complexity, and durability to, to let people know whether, whether they're headed down the right track or, or the next one. Uh, I'll give a quick plug for the next one. Paired up with the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, sometime in April or May, we're going to do this again, uh, focused on the tactical challenges for the forces. Um, I, I would say, uh, Annie, as you know, the experimental forward operating base is, is, I didn't pull it out in my comments earlier, but that's an opportunity for us to have a conversation with industry um, about our gaps and about their offered solutions. and. One of the things we've introduced in that process is, uh, again, bringing out a cross-section of Marines throughout each of these uh, semi-annual events uh, to get that initial feedback, kind of kick the tires, give them some, hey, this is not Marine-proof, or, or you could do some things differently here or there to make it a little bit better. So it gives them an immediate feedback uh, at that level, but we also you know, measure them against themselves, against what they say they can do, and give them the benefit of that data. Uh, and I think that's helped to generate a conversation with industry that, you know, continues to evolve. And that's that's one of the way primary ways we're engaging them. 
again, as a way to try to accelerate our learning and our development of requirements and their learning about us. Uh, so it's really a two-way street. We've had a, a range of more traditional approaches, uh, you know, partnering with ONR, partnering with RPE, can, coming to events like this, moving into smaller, more focused groups as we sponsor research that would be targeted towards our interest areas. We've also done some more, more innovative things like partnering with Naval Postgraduate School and ONR to run a Mowgli, an energy Mowgli, a, a massive multiplayer online war game leveraging the internet. I think a scientist made up that name. It wasn't me. But, in, but being able to do something like that and to get the story out to a broader audience and try to crowdsource the ideas and the solutions associated with it, I think over the course of the three-day period, um, there were five to 6,000 different ideas that were posted and played in a, in a facilitated fashion, uh, 37 different action plans that were uh, then modified to capture that. Some of those validated what we're doing already in the programs uh, and sort of things that we had heard about, but there were other things that were more of article. What about 3D printing? You know, look at the amount of energy that we consume just getting parts out to a ship and the weight that we put onto a ship and the energy that's consumed carrying those parts around. You know, if, if you shift from a traditional inventory management approach on board a warship and instead create a fabrication lab where you can use additive and subtractive manufacturing, you know, that radically changes what your supply chain looks like, what your supply runs are, what you're carrying on board, uh, because they're not dissimilar items. You don't have to have huge storerooms. You have smaller storerooms with more compact material storage. There's a lot of knock-on effects of that. And we wouldn't get different, more radical ideas like that unless we engage and reach out uh, through academia and, and other areas. So we're encouraged by the, the ideas that are out there and ideas that this type of crowd can possibly come up with for us, too. If I could j jump in on that example, um, uh, we, we similarly um, uh, are quite interested in what uh, industrial and academic and small uh, innovators can do. Um, great example is uh, small sets, small sets and pico sets. Um, uh, we have, I can't, can't go into all the details in this forum, but basically we've done a bunch of analyses and actually have an Air Force Scientific Advisory Board study ongoing right now. What I can say is that um, imagine you put up a satellite, cost you two, uh, maybe th three, five hundred billion, maybe, uh, million, maybe, maybe a billion dollars to put it up uh, versus two to five million to put it up. Um, that's a game changer. And I'm not making those numbers up. There, there are 20 to 30 pr business proposals across the community. Uh, to do an order of magnitude. And w what's driving that? Energy. Energy to get stuff into space. Um, we, we similarly have a, you know, a, a number of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding efforts uh, via our laboratory for Energy Horizons. We have, of course, held an RFI. We brought in a lot, lots of ideas from across the federal government and, and then other small companies. Um, it's also the case that we've certified our entire fleet. So we strongly believe in outsourcing. Um, we don't think the government is the best innovator, frankly, in this area. Um, and I can give you lots of evidence to, to show you that. And Frank, we're not the pr principal investor, um, so why should we be calling the shots? Um, so we have certified our entire fleet for biofuels in the Air Force, and we are ready to buy. Now the problem is, it's not economical enough yet. But we are doing things, we're not just, you're just waiting for industry to, to respond. Actually, the Navy and, and Department of Agriculture have been a great leader in this area. Um, so we're kind of you know, following their, their lead in terms of the production of biofuels. But I'll tell you, one of the things we've just recently discovered, which is quite interesting, we have a consortium, a, a, a government industrial consortium with all the major engine, engine manufacturers. And uh, we have a, a, a federal laboratory where we instrument the engines, we bring in uh, those industries, we share the data so that we can actually collectively create model, physics-based models of our avionics systems so that we can actually design future systems that don't exist yet today. Interestingly, we've just discovered that biofuels, because they burn at a much, uh, a much uh, less, um, um, at, at, a, at a lower temperature, um, on some of the critical parts within our core elements of our engines, we're discovering they can have between one and a half to as much as four times life extension. Now, if anybody's in logistics, um, and if, if you can give a 0.1% increase in life extension, you can make millions of dollars. So we're talking about revolutionary. Now, we don't know what this means, it, it, and I, I'm convinced it doesn't mean all the money we think it's going to mean. It's going to be some small fraction because the, the core elements in some of our compressors are very small portions of an overall engine. But 
Um, what it tells you is we don't understand the full implications of some of these new, new, new sources like biofuels. So we're ready to buy today. And I think outsourcing wherever we can is a good idea. Well, I am afraid that is all the time that we've got. But thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you all for coming out.